Um, today, happy um, first day of Black Breastfeeding Week. Um, and in honor of that, today's uh, session will be focusing on supporting Black and African American families with breastfeeding. Um, and it's my honor and privilege today to be here with Isaiah Harville, uh, my friend, colleague, partner. And so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Isaya um, to all of you. So um, Isaya is a IBCLC. She's also the birth equity coordinator for Cherished Futures for Black Moms and Babies with the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. Before she joined the Public Health Alliance of Southern California, she worked as a lactation consultant in a hospital providing education and family support. She's also created and taught prenatal breastfeeding classes free of charge to the community started and facilitated mommy support groups and uh, helped start the first lactation clinic in South Los Angeles to address uh, breastfeeding disparities in the area. She's worked in outpatient lactation at Kaiser Baldwin Park, and she has a really profound, amazing commitment and passion to supporting Black families and other historically underrepresented populations who are navigating parenthood, raising kids, um, and breastfeeding. And uh, she's an inspiration, and she's just here for breastfeeding. That's what she says. And that really means she's here for all the things. So that's a little bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Candace. I appreciate that. And yes, my catchphrase is I'm just here for lactation because lactation is all the things. And um, not enough people are talking about it, but hopefully throughout this series, you all will start to talk about it in your spaces. So thank you so much for that introduction. I get to introduce my friend Candace. So Candace Grignani is an adjunct assistant professor in the UCLA Department of Medicine and on faculty for the UCLA Preventative Medicine Program. She's the director of the UCLA Pathways for Students into Health Professions Program for disadvantaged undergrad students interested in public health and health professional careers. She's also the co-director of the UCLA Center of Excellence in Maternal and Child Health in the Graduate Training Program. Additionally, she serves as a as the Chapter Breastfeeding Coordinator for the American Academy of Pediatrics for California, Chapter 2. And these are just, um, yeah, the, these are the financial disclosures. The next couple of minutes are going to be boring. So, you know, again, if you need to step away, this is a great time. So Asaya doesn't have any financial disclosures to report. Um, in terms of me, I did do some research on a Pfizer-funded um, COVID pediatric household transmission study back in 2020, but that relationship was evaluated um, in terms of CME evaluation and was found not to be an issue for the purpose of this presentation. So um, we just wanted to let you know that this series is being supported by the Black Maternal Health Center of Excellence at the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science with funding from the Conrad and Hilton Foundation. It's also being supported in part by a HRSA grant um, that supports the UCLA Center of Excellence in Maternal and Child Health. So just so everyone knows, the contents that we talk about today represent um, Asaya and in my opinions, thoughts, um, and research, and they do not necessarily represent the official views, nor are they an endorsement by any of our funders. So HRSA, HHS, the US government, or anyone else who's contributed to funding this series. Um, no material is intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice for those in the community who may have stumbled upon um, this awesome educational series, but we hope it's helpful for you. And as always, we encourage community members to please seek the advice of your qualified healthcare provider with any questions you have regarding medical conditions, diagnoses, or treatment. So any ideas, questions, content, or statements made or discussed by us today are our own and shouldn't be construed as the official position or endorsement of anyone we work for or anyone um, that we take part in research with. Huh, sorry, we got through. Thank it. you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> got to do what we got to do. Yeah. All right. So I will take this one. So before we really dive into this topic for today, um, I do just want to sort of remind folks who, if this, is, if this is your first time with us, or maybe you've heard this before, I always like to give this sort of disclaimer that throughout the presentation, I do use terms such as mothers and mom, women and breastfeeding as shorthand for really all people who get pregnant, give birth, and in terms of feeding. However, I also um, recognize and acknowledge that this is not um, the way everyone identifies in, in terms of using these terms. And so I encourage the use of the terms that your patients identify with whenever you're supporting them. And that goes across the board, whether it is supporting them with breastfeeding or any other um, sort of issue, you want to make sure that you are being respectful of their wishes. Do you want me to do these, Candace? 
Yeah, oh, sorry, you're I was muted. Yeah, you think I'd have this figured out by now. So in terms of learning right. objectives, as I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is the third of a three-part series that Isaiah and I have been able to put on this summer around breastfeeding, um, breastfeeding support and breastfeeding equity. And so the learning objectives for today represent the learning objectives we're hoping that people who have joined all three of our sessions are able to achieve. All of our sessions offer CME credit and they're all recorded and posted on the AAP California Chapter 2 Lack website. So for those of you who have all registered, you'll get a link um, after this webinar series to get your CME. It'll also point you to the website if you want to watch the other sessions that perhaps you missed. Um, so you can watch the recordings and also get CME for those. So in terms of our learning objectives, so after completion of the educational series, we hope that those who have joined us will be able to identify commonly faced problems by breastfeeding moms, um, identify common hunger cues in newborns and infants, discuss the, discuss the safe storage and use of breast milk, create feeding plans for breastfeeding infants with a variety of common issues, such as NICU graduates, early weight loss, hyperbilly, discuss strategies at the outpatient level to enhance ongoing support of lactation for caregivers, and also primarily today, um, we'll be discussing how culture, systems, and structures impact breastfeeding journeys for moms from a variety of backgrounds. Awesome. All right. So as Candace mentioned, happy Black Breastfeeding Week, everyone. For those of you who are not aware, August 25th marks the first day of Black Breastfeeding Week, and it goes through August 31st every year. And it's really exciting because this is actually the 10th year of Black Breastfeeding Week being celebrated, being in observance, being acknowledged really on a national level. So that's really exciting for me, obviously, but also it should be exciting for all of you. Um, and at a previous session, we also talked about the other various cultural observances around uh, National Breastfeeding Month, which is the month of August. And so here we are at the end of August and we are celebrating Black Breastfeeding. This year's theme for Black Breastfeeding Week is 10 years, a new foundation. And I do just want to highlight that Black Breastfeeding Week was actually created um, by three national breastfeeding advocates. And this was in response to 40 plus years of really sort of um, a gaping racial disparity in terms of breastfeeding rates for Black families in comparison to other um, ethnic, ethnic groups. So it's really important that we want to acknowledge that. And if you all have patients that fit this description, please um, identify if there are opportunities to look into community for different events that are happening in your area or resources that um, might be in support of your patients. We really encourage you to do that. So before we really start to sort of dive into how we can best support um, Black families with breastfeeding and with lactation, I do think it's really important that we take a look at what the data tells us. And so this report here that you can see, or this uh, data here comes from actually a report from CHCS, the California Healthcare Foundation. And this is based in California. So I encourage those of you who are from out of state to also look at your own uh, individual state sort of breastfeeding rates. Um, hopefully they are disaggregated by race and ethnicity so that you can see um, what the data is actually telling you where you are located. And so if we take a look at these, um, this data here, this is from 2018. And so um, what does this graph appear to show, right? It's pretty simple, it's pretty nicely done. Um, it shows that the white percentage of in-hospital breastfeeding rates exclusively uh, for white um, infants would be at 81.2%. And if we look down to the bottom in blue, we have black infants at 61.5%. This information is actually taken from the newborn screening um, test form. So that's how they get the uh, feeding information and they disaggregate it by race and ethnicity. Um, so I want us to be thinking about what this graph is showing us and sort of start to, to think about what it means when we see this data around um, a breastfeeding disparity that is, you know, it looks pretty obvious. It looks like there's a, there's a really huge hole here, but we're going to talk a little bit later about why that exists. So if we take a look here at this, um, at this next slide, this is actually in, um, in hospital breastfeeding data from the California Department of Public Health. This is from 2019. Again, it's just aggregated by race and ethnicity. And here they actually have the distinction between any breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding. So for those of you who might not know the difference, exclusive breastfeeding just means they are being fed nothing other than mom's direct breast milk. Any breastfeeding would mean that they were supplemented at some point. It might have only been one bottle, it might have only been two, but they are still considered any breastfeeding. So we see a similar um, statistic here where the state of California has about a 93.7% uh, rate of any breastfeeding. 
and we look at the African American rate, it's it's up there, right? So it's not too much of a disparity. It is lower than the rest of the ethnicities that are listed, but not by much, right? But then when we look over here to the exclusive breastfeeding rate, we do start to see where that gap uh, is widening a bit. And so I think that's really important for us to have some context for what this looks like. I have not yet seen a report for 2020 or 2021. So this is the most recent data that I was able to find. If someone else has something more recent, please feel free to share in the chat. Um, and then one more piece of data that I do want to share is this now local to Los Angeles County. So because we are the local chapter of the AAP, I did think it was really important that we share um, this county's breastfeeding data, and we see the same rates here. So that first, um, that first column where it starts with 92 for Los Angeles, that's also the any breastfeeding rate, and the other one on the right side would be the exclusive. And we see that the, the numbers are pretty consistent across the board, right? So for African American uh, babies, it's about 86.6% per, of any breastfeeding. And then we drop down to about 57% for exclusive breastfeeding in LA County. And this is compared to you know, all of these other races here. But if we took the white um, uh, ethnicity here, we can see that they start at 95% and their drop off only goes down to about 78%. So it's just important context for us when we're thinking about um, why the why the disparities um, or what the disparities are before we start to sort of dig into why. And I just want to encourage us to also start to think about, you know, depending on our own experiences and perceptions, we can actually really take different explanations about why a particular problem or a particular disparity in data exists, right? So if we were just looking at the data and nothing else, we could we could sort of interpret it in the way that we would want, right? So some, some, some interpretations that I have heard are black women don't breastfeed, right? It, the data shows that they, they breastfeed at significantly lower rates and that just means that they don't wanna breastfeed or they're not gonna breastfeed anyway, or they don't really know the importance or the, the benefits of breastfeeding. There's all sorts of interpretations that we can really take when we're just looking at data, right? Um, but, you know, the part of the purpose of today's um, session is really to think about um, data within context, because without context, um, the data alone actually has the potential to confirm false narratives that are perpetuated specifically for uh, with, throughout healthcare, but especially around, you know, Black women and when it comes to their breastfeeding rates. So that's a really important piece of context that I also want to add. And so I really like this quote here from Alan Jenkins, and it just says that the audiences, that audiences will interpret the same facts differently depending on the narrative that is most salient in their minds. And so really when we think about what the data is telling us, we're not just bringing in a mathematical lens, right? We are, we are bringing in our lived experiences, we are bringing in our upbringing, we are bringing in our own individual internal processing, which all play a role in how we interpret the things that we see or the things that we hear. Data is actually helpful though. So I don't want you to think I'm against data, right? Data is a good thing. Data is helpful for us to really start to begin to review and understand where gaps uh, or potentially where gaps are, where there's opportunities and where we should maybe consider beginning or having a, a more targeted approach for interventions, right? So if we didn't know the data, we wouldn't know where to start. And it's really important that we have that piece of information to help inform some of our interventions. And so now that we have discussed data a little bit, I am actually going to talk a little bit about more context for that data, because again, the data alone doesn't actually tell the whole story. And so I do want to also just um, put out there that the following information might be well known, might be familiar for some, but for others, this might be the first time you're hearing about some of this. And some of it, I, I will admit, it's, it's difficult to hear, it's difficult to digest, and it might even bring out, up certain feelings for you, feelings of discomfort or um, denial, whatever those feelings might be. And I want to encourage you to sit through uh, and sit with that discomfort, not to run from it in any way, because one of the things that um, is really important for me is that we start to dialogue more about these things so that it's not just sort of fear-based or, or based on limited information, but that we can really start to um, sort of peel back the layers and understand why some of these things um, came to be. And so we have to start this conversation with context around what racism is, right? Because racism is one of the key factors when we think about why disparities exist. And so it's really also important that we have a sort of a shared understanding of how we describe racism. 
because oftentimes, um, you know, racism is, is kind of thrown about all, all over the place, right? Whether it's in the media, whether it is in social media, whether it is, you know, in articles or, or different research. And it's really sort of commonplace nowadays. Um, and we think it's really, I think it's really important to really uh, provide this definition. Um, so racism in this context is really about a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks which is what we call race. And so for those of you, hopefully everybody on the line knows, but race is a social construct. It doesn't, there's, there's not really a thing called race. There is ethnicity, there are, you know, things like that, but race is actually a construct. And that's something that society created for all of the reasons that it created it, right? Um, and it's important to also understand that really racism actually unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, right, which is what maybe we can interpret from some of that data. But something that we also don't really think about is that racism actually unfairly advantages other individuals and communities as well. And ultimately what that does is um, take away the strength of the whole society through the, through the wasting of human resources. And this definition and sort of this um, framework of thinking about racism as a, social, uh, as a social issue and as a structural issue comes from Dr. Kamara Jones. Um, and she really emphasizes that racism is a system of power. It's not about an individual set of actions, right? So it's not when we think about, did someone do something that was racist? That's not actually what we're talking about when we think about racism. We're actually talking about the structures that are in place um, that create these institutions where, again, folks can be either unfairly disadvantaged or advantaged. So it's really important that we have that sort of shared definition when we're moving forward. And so the next piece that I'm going to be talking about is actually sort of diving into how that has presented itself in the United States. And so I don't know how many of you have seen this photo. I know it comes out every now and again. It often gets reported every now and again for nudity or other things, but it's really, it's really a powerful photo to me. And so I want us to just sort of sit and think about this photo for a minute. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about sort of context for the photo. So history of, the, of breastfeeding for black women in the United States, we can't really talk about it without talking about enslavement, obviously, the enslavement of Africans, but then also what happened afterwards. And we're gonna get to a timeline of that in a bit. Um, but it's really important that we look at this photo and we think about, you know, let's, let's think about what this woman might be feeling in this moment, right? She, she is breastfeeding this baby who clearly is not her baby, right? Um, she's exposed. Look at the, the expression on her face. The baby looks pretty happy because the baby is, you know, getting nourished, but I don't see happiness in this woman's photo. Um, and I want you all to see this photo because I think it's important that we provide additional context for that data, right? When we think about, um, you know, often we think about intergen intergenerational trauma, right? We think about, you know, uh, folks who come back from war and what that does. We think about things like the Holocaust, right? and how that sort of trickles down into generations. So it's not just the person who experienced the trauma, it's their children, their children's children, et cetera, et cetera. But often we don't think about how the impact of slavery sort of follows generationally for black women in the United States. And I would also just expand that to say, anywhere that experienced the enslavement of Africans will have the same issue, right? Because it was not exclusive to, to the United States. It happened, you know, sort of globally. And so this uh, woman here is very clearly a wet nurse is what they used to call it. And um, I found this really interesting article that was talking about wet nursing. And it was saying that the extent of wet nursing under slavery is actually difficult to quantify. And it's because historians have had a difficult time sort of understanding uh, and gathering information for how many women were actually used for this practice. And this practice has also yet to receive um, uh, systematic analysis from historians of US slavery. And few studies really want to even highlight the enslaved woman's concerns or their, how, they had to infant, uh, how they had to feed infants. Um, and this comes from University of Reading's researchers, Emily West and RJ Knight. And it's from a 2017 article in the Journal of Southern History. And there's also some additional research by Sally McMillan, who's a professor of history and a department chair at Davidson College. And she actually estimates that one fifth of slave owners actually relied on enslaved wet nurses to care for their children in the South. 
And so that's just in the southern United States. That does not include the rest of the United States, right? And so when they had to sort of think about what that number looked like, they estimate that there could have been as many as 70,000 wet nurses across the South based on the population data and population counts of the slave owners in about the year 1850. And so when we think about that, what does that mean? That means that often, um, you know, enslaved uh, African women were used as wet nurses. They were often not able to feed their babies, which we're going to get to in a second. And I want us to, again, continue thinking about what this does to the psyche, what this, what this does to a generation and generations following um, when such a trauma uh, is experienced. And so some additional historical context, again, we want to think about data, but we want to think about data in context. And so um, this photo is actually really unique to me because it was, it was very rare that you could actually find someone uh, who was breastfeeding and being used as a wet nurse at the same time, because it was actually mandated that only one breast could be used to feed the white child. So before there were segregated um, uh, water fountains, there were segregated breasts. And this was mandated by those who were uh, in ownership of these African uh, women. And so if she were to switch and let, you know, the black child, her own child, suckle from the same breast as the white child, she could actually be punished by being whipped because it was as though she was, the baby was sharing from the same water fountain. And so... Again, I want us to think about this trauma of slavery in the United States. It's literally still within the DNA of Black women because of that process of intergenerational trauma. And so if we start to think about what happened to these women, right, and what happened to their children, imagine the only way that you are able to nourish your, your infant is this way. So you can't switch from right, left, left breast, right breast to left breast. You can't have your baby on the same baby as the person who is you know, enslaving you um, to feed. Or worse, let's think about what happens when we don't actually get this picture and when your, in, your infant is actually either sold or taken away from you shortly after birth, and then you're forced to still breastfeed the child of the person who has enslaved you. What does that do to your psyche? What does that do to you as a person? And what does that do to the, to the, to the generations that follow you? And so I also want us to think about how this translates to future generations, right? So in later generations, this might have translated to something like, well, we aren't slaves anymore. We don't have to breastfeed, right? And so, and I share that quote because that's actually a quote from my grandfather to my grandmother. When I asked my mom what she was breastfed, she's one of seven, um, she remembers very clearly that her father told her mother, we aren't slaves anymore. We don't have to breastfeed. Mind you, they were not born any time near slavery, but this is what I'm talking about when I say intergenerational trauma, right? This is a personal thing that even though this was not the woman, my grandmother who was saying this, this was actually my grandfather, it impacts both sides so deeply, right? So it's really important for us to think about that context when we also are thinking back to what that data was showing us, because it wasn't that long ago, right, that that our grand, my grandparents were alive. It wasn't it wasn't so it wasn't hundreds of years ago. This is very recent. So really important for us to have that context. And so this next slide just sort of shows the timeline of what we call racialized terror and policies in the United States. This is a slide that we use in my work in Cherished Futures. And it's taken from uh, um, Black History, a history of permanent white oppression from 1619 to 2016. And so when you take a look at this sort of timeline, you see here that um, it's really a timeline of the Black experience in the United States, right? So how did Black people come to be, right, if we're talking about the United States? And really it shows here that the first enslaved Africans arrived in 1619. People were then enslaved, Black people were then enslaved for 246 years. And even after the end of slavery, Black people still lived under restrictive laws called Black Codes and other Jim Crow laws, which legally mandated segregation of public spaces. And as I mentioned, things like water fountains and bathrooms and other social interactions were actually prevented. So things like Jim Crow laws, which um, you may or may not have heard of, that meant that Black men were not allowed to offer to shake hands with a white man that white motorists always had the right of way, and that Black people were never able to or allowed to demonstrate superior knowledge or intelligence. And that's really important, too. 
And so it really wasn't until about 1964, which was about 100 years after slavery ended, that the Civil Rights Act was passed, which then outlawed that segregation that was happening in public spaces. But even now, it's really only been about 58 years since the Civil Rights Act, right? Um, and it's only been, that means it's only been about 58 years since Black people have had equal rights under law. But in addition to them having equal rights, quote unquote, the system that was in place before that has actually made it so that the system does not support them. So whether we are thinking about the healthcare system, education system, judicial system, et cetera, all of those systems that were in place disproportionately impact in a negative way Black Americans. So it's really important for us to sort of think about that, again, applying it to the data, because if we know that there are systems in place that were not there to support Black women, to support enslaved African women to breastfeed, then it's no wonder that some of these rates are, are showing up, right? And so with that, I know that was a lot in terms of history. I think it's important that we take a minute, right? So let's take a minute, and Candice, feel free to jump in with any thoughts. Um, and this is, for those of you, if, if this is your first time joining, we like this to be a really uh, a space for dialogue and conversation. We welcome the dialogue and conversation. Um, and it's really important that we sort of think about how folks are feeling about this and how, how, if they've ever heard of this, right? Is this something that you had heard of? Is this something that you had thought of in terms of looking at data and maybe why some of the um, disparities for breastfeeding rates exist? Did you ever correlate the sort of history of enslaved Africans to the breastfeeding rates now? I would love to hear from folks. Um, so feel free to raise your hand and I think Candace, maybe you can help me out. Usually Candace will let me know because I can't really see everybody yes. raise hands. So please feel free to uh, raise your hand and then come off mute, mute when Candace sees you. Um, and Whit Whitney has her hand raised. So go ahead, Whitney. Let me turn on my camera so you can see my face. So oh, wonderful. Thank you. Hey, Whitney. Hi, <laughs> beautiful um, face. I live in Colorado and my family's from the South. So I understand exactly what you're saying because when I started breastfeeding with my son and I nursed him all the way up until four, which is completely unheard of. And I received so much flag. And so to really understand this timeline and the trauma, and I was the one in the first one in like two generations that decided to breastfeed because I, I had breast. And I was looked at as a, if I was crazy, like, no, we don't breastfeed. And I'm like, but, but I have breasts. I make milk. Why, why is this absurd? And so for, I am really grateful and I appreciate this talk so much because this is, this is our life. This is my life, what you were talking about. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I want to just acknowledge that, that I can only imagine, right, how hard that would have been to be the first. Um, and to have sort of this, I don't understand, right? Like, where does this sort of mindset come from? Whether it's from family that's sort of discouraging you or friends or other healthcare professionals, right? And often we don't know where some of these recommendations or some of this advice comes from, right? And so, yeah, I, I so appreciate you sharing that because I do think um, it's important to share sort of our experiences out loud because often we can feel like we are the only one. Often we can feel like, well, this, this can't be happening to other people, right? Is, is there something wrong with me that I'm the one that's getting sort of this feedback? Um, and I just want to elevate how amazing you are for breastfeeding until four. Girl, you're better than me. I made it to one and a half with my first and two and a half with my second. So good for you. For, for I, I mean, let's think about that. Like, that's such adversity, right? When the folks in your sort of inner circle um, are not um, aware of where some of the, their thought process comes from. And they're wanting to they mean well, but they're not necessarily being supportive knowing sometimes where that comes from, that's why it's important to have context with data, right? That's why it's important to know our stories. That's why it's important to ask those questions um, because how else will we know? We'll think we are crazy for having these individual experiences that really aren't so individual. So I just wanna sort of kudos to you and thank you so much for sharing that. That means a lot to me to hear your story. I appreciate it. Thank you. Other thoughts, questions, comments? 
I guess, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, this is from Priyanka. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm, Priyanka. Hi, nice to see you. Um, one question I have for uh, you and Whitney and other uh, women who have had this experience, um, like how do you go about navigating um, that? Because uh, it might be that the, uh, yeah, the, the advice might come, but the uh, folks might not have that historical context always. So how, yeah, how do you navigate that? Yeah, it's a great question. I'd love to hear Whitney's response. I can give a really short one, but I'd love to hear how Whitney sort of navigated that. For me, um, you know, I, I was actually not the first. My mom was the first. So I asked her that same question. I said, well, what made you want to breastfeed when your mom did not breastfeed, right? Um, and this is after I was, you know, well into sort of the lactation world. And you know what she told me? Because, you know, I am, I won't say my age, not that there's anything wrong with it, but 30 plus years ago, right? There was no breastfeeding classes. There was no prenatal classes for any of that. That We didn't have a lot of sort of the awareness and the knowledge, right? So I asked my mom, what is it that made her breastfeed? And she told me that the nurse said it was better for the baby. And that was it. She didn't have an extensive class. She didn't have a series of classes. For her as an individual, that was what was all she needed. And I would say that there isn't really a one size fits all. In my experience, um, that might not be enough for somebody to decide to breastfeed, right? Just saying that, well, it's better for the baby. Um, so for me, it's I, asking those questions is really important. Knowing where you come from, knowing how you were fed um, without sort of providing judgment about that, right? Because that's the other piece. It's like, you don't want to make the grandmother or the auntie feel bad for the way that they chose to feed their baby because they probably didn't have support either, right? When we're thinking about, again, intergenerational trauma, it doesn't just stop with that person. It continues on really until someone sort of shifts the paradigm for that family. So I, that's how I approach it. It's just, it's very individual, but I think asking the question of how, how you were fed, um, how they chose to feed you, if you are their child, right? sort of starts to bring them into the conversation. And then if they're open to learning more, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can do that with family, but that's how I did it. And I'd love to hear from Whitney how she navigated that. So at the time when I was expecting my son, uh, which was 14 years ago, he'll be 14 in October, um, I was pretty much homeless. And I, I knew I was going to breastfeed. One, I couldn't afford formula, even though I was on WIC. And growing up, like, you know, nieces and nephews being formula fed and just watching the prices, I was like, I can't afford to purchase infant formula. I just, I just can't do it. And so because I knew that I had breast and I make milk, that's what I'm going to do because I was poor. I was broke and I made food. And that was my reasoning all by itself is I make food. So that's it. Let's use it. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And again, this is why narrative is important. This is why context is important. Because had you not known, right, you have you might have a different interpretation of what the rates are and why they are the way that they are, right? Because for every Whitney, there is someone else who is choosing not to breastfeed or feels like they are incapable or feels like they are unable. So it's really important to, again, especially for my providers that are on the line, start to seek out the context in addition to looking at the data. Because when you ask those, those targeted questions and really make it sort of an individual experience, you might be able to navigate a little bit better how, how to support um, your patients with breastfeeding. Any other thoughts or reflections before we move on? feel free to raise your hand. Feel also free if you are not in a space where you want to talk about it. Feel also free to um, put things in the chat. We are happy to sort of read those out as well. Candace, let me know if there's any other hands because I can't see them. No, there's there's no other hands up right now. And I think I just wanted to add to, okay. I mean, um, it's been I, like I've had the privilege of getting to learn so much from ASEA over the last few years. And I can speak to my own medical training, but this is not something that in terms of the history of 
of breastfeeding, um, particularly for black mothers, that's not anything I ever learned about, not in school, right? Like in terms of my elementary or high school education and not as a trainee. And it is like so incredibly important to the narrative that you're talking about and the context in which um, families come from and generations have come from, right? And it it is so vital, I think, to giving trainees and providers perspective on the conversation because sometimes I think we get so caught up in, um, you know, checking the box and that we made X recommendation, right? And we're failing to actually have meaningful conversations and inquire and be curious and um, and appreciate all of this really loaded um history that's occurred um and we can't extrapolate our conversations from all of these things because that's what brought everybody to the moment that we're sharing together so anyway i always just um yeah i always reflect on that every time i hear you talk about all of this so thank you and jocelyn has her hand up so i'm gonna jocelyn you can feel free to check. hey jocelyn hi everyone thank you so much for doing this and for being here this just is so so extraordinary um Every time I see that slide, and I think Isaiah, you were the first person that that showed that slide at I think one of our first Cherish Features meetings, and I'm so struck by how much time is consolidated and reflected in that, and how so little time has passed since we dealt with not just like Reconstruction after slavery technically ended, but also Jim Crow and the passing of the Civil Rights Act, and how much has happened and not happened since that time. And it can be so overwhelming and frustrating. But I'm really like overcome with this incredible gratitude for people like you who are doing this work to help people like me understand and give context and help us not just acknowledge, but change our practice and how we admit how we provide care to these birthing people, their families, because it is just in this last couple months, it has dramatically changed how I approach these, these dyads. And um, it's rather than choosing to be overwhelmed by the scope, I just, I'm really grateful and inspired. And that, that's kind of my, my big takeaway. So thank you for doing this. No, thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate that. And it's, as I mentioned, it's tough, right? It's heavy information. Um, it's heavy to hear. It's hard to see. Um, I think our probably our, our our innate innate visceral reaction is to want to look at a, look away or change the subject or you know somehow dismiss it as you know that was then, right? But I think what you what you just talked about, Jocelyn, is is really so true when we think about how little time really has passed. Um, and you know, when I when I mentioned intergenerational trauma, something that often comes up is like, oh, we discovered it when you know we were talking about Holocaust survivors, right? That's sort of like the sort of turning point that people started to acknowledge that this was happening. Meanwhile, Black folks and Indigenous folks have been talking about this and really knowledgeable about this for generations, right? So, again, it's the goal for today is to give some historical context, to think about, you know, sort of the narratives that are missing from the data, but then also to talk about like what can be done because it really can be overwhelming. It's overwhelming for me sometimes. I will share a, a story at the end, which, you know, will hopefully give you all a little bit of hope, but it, it's very overwhelming to hear, to see, to be a part of, especially when this is sort of the work that you do. Um, so I just encourage folks to move through it as opposed to trying to avoid it. Um, because on the other side of it, you will become a, such a better provider to your patients. And that is yes to black patients, but really to all patients, right? Because you will start to understand that everyone comes with a story. Everyone comes with their own individual context outside of what that chart is telling you about them. Um, and you can also start to think about how to engage their, their circle, how to engage their family, how to engage them in their care. Because really that's who is sort of tasked with care after they leave your hands. And if we can engage them in a positive way that gets them sort of participating in the patient's care, then that just is an improvement for the community overall. So appreciate those thoughts, Jocelyn. So we are gonna move forward if that's okay with everyone. Again, if you have other thoughts, please feel free to share them in the chat. We would love to read them. Um, so we talked a little bit about the history, right? We gave a little bit of timeline. 
Um, and so I think it's important that we sort of fast forward a little bit in the interest of time to think about modern society, right? And so this article, uh, this is actually a, a caption from an article that was published on the, in the conversation, which is online. And it's talking about how the United States support over formula, support of formula over breastfeeding is actually a race issue. And within this article, it talks about how recently the United States the, the United States actually threatened Ecuador with trade and aid restrictions if it did not withdraw a World Health Assembly breastfeeding promotion resolution that every other nation actually thought was fine and every other nation sort of signed on to. The article then uh, continues on talking about how it has, the United States has really previously sort of demonstrated its allegiance to the formula industry by refusing to sign on to the World Health Organization's ban on the marketing of breast milk alternatives. Um, for those of you who are interested, you can take a look at um, some of that information on the World Health Organization's website. Um, they've done some extensive work around the uh, marketing of breast milk substitutes and how it's unethical by the formula company. Um, and then society really in the United States is just not in support of breastfeeding is what the, what the article you know, continues on. And it's also allowed strategically targeted ads for formula and by formula makers uh, to be marketed to black women. Now, if we think about the rates of infant mortality, and we think about what breastfeeding can do to decrease the risk of infant mortality, yet society is allowing formula companies to target black women, it's no wonder also, right, that this is a contrib contributing factor to that data that I showed you all earlier. So again, data without that context really doesn't tell us the whole story. So it's important that we know some of this um, because then it will hopefully start to change the way that we view some of the things that we see, some of the things that we read, and how we sort of approach um, patient care to be really centered on what the patient needs um, and acknowledging that they, they come with a lot, right? So if you all have a chance, look at that article on the conversation. Um, and then another factor. So this is more pop culture, sort of social media, um, but we think about what the data doesn't tell us is about the hypersexualization of Black women's bodies in society. And so we see this comparison of these two articles here. Look at the title of the first one with Bella Hadid. Um, Bella Hadid is next level edgy in glamour Germany. And it says cool girl alert. So shout out to the cool girls, I guess, right? And in the next photo, we see Rihanna. And this title of this article says, yes, Rihanna is basically naked in her new song, but here's what she is wearing. Mind you, they are wearing the exact same thing, right? So this is an example of how this ex is exhibited in popular culture or on social media and things like that. But it really has extensive roots that predate both social media and popular culture. So for those of you who have the time and are interested, um, I didn't include them here, but there are some really amazing articles about the hypersexualization of Black women's bodies in society, how that actually starts for Black girls um, in childhood, which is really unfortunate. But I do encourage you all, if you're interested, to sort of look up some of those. And maybe, Candice, we can add some of those links for resources um, in the follow-up, just so you guys can also see that those studies, studies have been done. And this, again, is a contributing factor. And so if we are hypersexualizing Black women's bodies in society, as Whitney mentioned, she's getting comments about, well, I have breasts and this is how I'm going to feed my baby. But if black bodies are hypersexualized, that they're they are not going to be viewed as mechanisms to feed a baby, right? They're going to be viewed for other things. And that again plays into some of some of the narratives and some of the ways that um, black women are sort of conditioned to believe about their own bodies. It sort of affects their self-esteem potentially, their self-confidence, or their uh, understanding of how their body can actually be nourishing to their baby. So again, another factor that the, uh, that the data doesn't actually tell us. And so let's transition a little bit to healthcare's role, right? So when we think about what is the role of healthcare in terms of supporting lactation, in terms of supporting breastfeeding. So I have a couple of bullets here, and it's really um, when we think about uh, lactation in, in general. Um, mostly, it's a lot of personal experience because there is a lack of formalized training, lactation training, 
either in nursing school and medical school and public health school and all the schools that are, uh, you know, people who may have an interaction with people who are breastfeeding, um, there really isn't a, a whole lot of formalized education, as Candace mentioned. So for me, as an IVCLC, we actually are required to go through a minimum of 90 hours of lactation-specific training. And so that is not, um, that's, that's something that we get as a way to sort of inform our practice, right? But it's also something that none of our other sort of co-providers actually have. So that's why in previous sessions, I've also encouraged you all to think through how you can sort of partner with lactation, whether they are lactation educators or international board certified lactation consultants, because we have extensive education that unfortunately you all schools did not provide you because there's lots of other things happening in nursing school and medical school, right? Um, lactation is not required learning as part of medical school or nursing school, which again, if I have patients that are going to be lactating, and I think we, we sort of miss the mark when we think about it being, well, babies breastfeed, right? But it's actually mom and baby, right? Because it's a mom and baby diet. So you may be interacting with someone in their teenage years or their early adulthood who has the capacity for lactation. That does impact you as a provider, whether they are currently lactating or not. So again, that lack of formalized training is going to impact your ability to support them in preconception, during pregnancy, after delivery, et cetera. And something that is also really interesting that I have found is that breastfeeding is really one of the only fields where I've heard clinicians talk about their personal experience with it. You don't really hear this in any other sort of uh, form of medicine practice. Um, you don't hear it around diabetes, you don't hear it around cancer treatments or orthopedics or neurology, but you hear it in breastfeeding. Everybody has a breastfeeding story, whether it's positive or negative, whether it's their own or based on the things that they have heard. And that comes sometimes in the form of misinformation and a lack of support of breastfeeding, right? Um, and then we think about how, when we think about how this impacts Black moms and babies, again, think back to that data. There's less overall lactation support for Black moms and babies. Um, there is some information out that says that for every baby born in Los Angeles County, I believe it's Los Angeles County, um, it might be actually the state of California, um, there are three white lactation consultants for every baby born. Yet nationally, there are less than 2% black lactation consultants, right? So we could talk about pipeline, we could talk about how that impacts, you know, the ability to support black breastfeeding, but overall, there is sort of a disproportionate um, uh, weight for non-lactation uh, consultants of color, and that is uh, obviously having a direct impact in breastfeeding as well. Um, and additionally, um, less, less overall lactation support for Black moms and babies also, become, also uh, comes from assumptions about Black moms not wanting to breastfeed, not being interested in breastfeeding, or based on, again, looking only at that data. I have personally heard stories when I worked in patient where the nurses would say, don't bother going in there. She doesn't want to breastfeed anyway, right? And this was based on their interaction with the patient. So I would say, okay, let me just go in and check. I would go in and, you know, talk to them and come out 45 minutes to an hour later, and they would be surprised that the mom had the baby at breast. And they would say, well, how did you do that? Well, I didn't do anything. I just asked a couple of questions. I provided some information. And I sort of got to the, the context and that narrative and that person's individual story. And I didn't make assumptions about how they wanted to feed their baby because I tell moms all the time, and you should think this in your head as well, I'm not taking the baby home. You gotta feed this baby, right? I can be here to support you. I can educate you. I can give you all of the tools, but ultimately it's your choice, right? But if we take that choice away from black moms and babies, again, let's think about the impact. When black babies are dying at higher rates, when breastfeeding is, a mechanism to support thriving in Black lives, but we are not providing Black women the support for breastfeeding, how are we contributing to those infant mortality rates? Because we are making assumptions about Black mothers not wanting to breastfeed or not being interested. So again, really important for us to think about, especially um, as healthcare providers, because it does impact um, the mom and it impacts the family ultimately. So this is um, some information around differential experiences in healthcare. This is also a contributing factor to that narrative that Black women um, experience. And so this study comes from Ignored and Invisible. Again, it's something if you want to take, if you want to look it up, um, that's the title of it. And it's perspectives from Black women, clinicians, and community-based organizations for reducing preterm birth 
in the Maternal Child Health Journal. Um, and you see here issues such as disrespect, abuse, and discrimination within the healthcare system play a significant role in how women of color access and experience care during pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. We will just put a little, you know, parentheses and include lactation in there. And that contributes to those adverse outcomes for the mom and the baby. So again, attention to commu communication that is of quality and trust building has actually been shown to improve perceptions of care for black women during pregnancy. And so that's really, really important because if we can develop a relationship with the black woman, we are better able to understand her situation, her story, her narrative, and better able to really support her overall. The lack of safety that is also felt by black women as shared in this study uh, is repeated often in focus groups. And more importantly, it's also being repeated in the communities where your patients live and where they work and where they receive care. Um, and that's also important to know because that means they're talking about you as a provider. And we want our patients to talk about us in a positive way and that we positively impacted them, right? Or at least I do, maybe some people don't, but I know I do. So it's important for us to think about um, overall as a system. Again, when we think back to what racism is as a, a structure, the healthcare system uh, has created an unsafe environment for Black women. And the Black women's stress, uh, having to navigate that system is often very hostile to them and does contribute to their desire or ability or um, um, opportunity to breastfeed their babies. And so just one more um, really quick research study that I found that's really important. So this one is the Giving Voice to Mothers study, and it's about inequity and mistreatment during pregnancy and childbirth in the United States. And so you see here, this, is, this study was published in 2019, and it surveyed over 2,100 white, black, Hispanic, indigenous, and Asian people who gave birth between 2010 and about 2016. One in six of those uh, reported in experiencing one or more types of mistreatment, such as loss of autonomy, being shouted at, scolded, or threatened, being ignored or refused, or receiving no response to requests for help. How this shows up in lactation, I have had many a patient who I saw after they had been seen or delivered their baby who were told that there was no lactation able to see them or were told that they were going to get the lactation consult and they never did. Um, I supported a mom who was in the hospital for five days after her C-section, and she received one, she estimated about seven-minute consult for lactation, and after that, she was not seen, even though she was repeatedly, she repeatedly asked um, to be seen, asked to be helped, and it wasn't until her baby was losing weight that she was told, well, you have to formula feed now, but for the previous four or five days, she didn't receive really any support. So when we think about that, think about how many people touch that patient in a five-day stay in the hospital. It's not just the physician, it's the nurses, it's lactation, it's whoever, right? There's multiple people in and out. And in that time, she got a seven-minute interaction. This was a Black mom, of course. Um, thankfully, I was able to see her. We were able to get that baby back to exclusive breastfeeding, and she was able to breastfeed beyond one year, which is really exciting. But that might not have been her story had she not been able to receive some additional resources. So again, thinking about um, women being ignored, refused, or, re or not receiving um, response for requests for help, white women were least likely to report re uh, experiencing any of these indicators, and women of color were twice as likely to report that a healthcare provider ignored them, refused their request for help, or failed to respond to requests for help in a reasonable time. So this is really important too, to provide that context for the data. And so now I'm gonna show a really short video um, from one of my friends and colleagues who is actually one of the founders of Black Breastfeeding Week. Her name is Kimberly Seals Allers. She's amazing. Um, she's an author. She's all the things. She is also the creator of the Earth app. If you all have not heard of it, it's an amazing app where Black and brown folks can actually review their experiences from labor delivery, postpartum, and pediatric uh, interactions. And they can talk about how they were treated. They can um, sort of uh, elevate their experiences. So if you haven't heard of it, definitely look up the Earth app. And I'm going to play this video really quick. Hopefully, you guys could hear it. Candace, let me know if um, we can't hear the sound for some reason. Will do. And so when we think about this connection between fast black birth outcomes, breastfeeding, infant mortality, it should not be lost on any of us. 
that the same black women who are working the most because we were breeders, because our babies had economic value as laborers to the capital system, and were breastfeeding the most because our milk was wanted for others, are now the ones who are breastfeeding the least, and our babies are dying the most, and we too are dying the most in childbirth. I need you to sit with that for a second. What can we do to address the lack of trust? I love this quote by Dr. Shah, who says, it's not for providers to expect communities of color to be more trusted. We have to become more trustworthy, right? What are you actively doing in your hospital to create a trust creation process? Where's the intention? Where's the action? Where's the accountability, right? How are you cultivating trust? Now, remember, the earned distrust predates you. But we've seen the impact of it play out across the board, particularly during the pandemic. So we have to be thinking about creating trust. All right. So that is, again, friend and colleague, and she's one of the co-creators of Black Breastfeeding Week, and that was um, at one of our Terrace Futures convenes that she was talking about. And her app, again, reviews um, folks' breastfeeding experiences, whether they received breastfeeding support in the hospital uh, or any sort of education prenatally. It also reviews their pediatric experiences, but experiences as well. So highly encourage you all to take a look at that. Um, because, you know, hopefully you're getting good reviews as a provider. But if not, there's opportunity for change, for sure. Oh, we're not going to play it again. Hold on. There we go. All right. So with all of that said, right, with the historical context, with sort of the society context and the implications around that, what are the implications and what's the impact on Black families, right? And how does this impact Black patients? Again, we talked this, about this a little bit. So there are assumptions about feeding prefer preferences when we look at the data. Um, for black moms, this also actually means less support for exclusive breastfeeding because they are assumed to not want to breastfeed, right? So they might not be seen by a lactation consultant in the hospital. They might not get follow-up post-discharge. Um, they're also more likely to be offered formula. There are lots of studies that actually show this. Um, black babies in the NICU are less likely to be offered uh, human donor milk, and parents are less, uh, less likely to be educated on the benefits of human donor milk in the NICU. Um, there are stereotypes about the uh, NICU baby as well as just, you know, well babies overall. So things like, oh, uh, you know, black girls are so strong, black baby girls are so strong, they're so re resilient. This is often heard also in the NICU. Um, and that white boys or white infant boys are actually weaker or more fragile or need su more support and more care in the NICU. Um, and that often translates to increased support for breastfeeding, increased access to human donor milk. And so I just want us to imagine already be uh, an, an infant already being labeled as resilient, right? Resilient isn't a bad thing inherently, but resilience for an infant is a burden when we're thinking about it in this context, right? Um, and I like to share that infants really just deserve to be labeled as soft and deserving of love and having the best opportunities um, and trajectory in order to thrive. And so if we are taking that away from Black baby girls specifically and really Black babies overall, right from the start, let's imagine how that sort of trickles down throughout their, their growth and, and their development in our society, knowing that we live in a society that is not as supportive of them as individuals as it is for other groups. Um, and so again, this will translate to a negative impact on lactation for black families. There's also just misinformation about the physiology of lactation that we talked about. So when you know, medical schools and nursing schools are not required to have lactation education, there is a lot, often a miseducation around the physiology that can then negatively impact black families. Again, breasts are sexualized often. And I added this last one here, birth control options, because I do think it's really important that we think about that. Um, so when I worked in hospital, oftentimes um, folks would be, you know, counseled around what is their preferred method of birth control prior to be, being discharged. What we know is that Black women are more likely to be offered and given some of the longer acting birth control methods, whether they be the depo shot or others, um, that actually have a negative impact on lactation. And the justification for that from providers is that, well, she, she might not come to her postpartum visit. We don't want her getting pregnant and coming back here before her postpartum visit. So if you are someone who works in a hospital, I want you to think about who that gets offered to. 
And I want you to think about who is assumed that they will not return for postpartum visits. And I also want you to think about what the actual manufacturer of the depot shot or other uh, um, um, birth control methods actually says about that. It actually says on the label not to give prior to four to six weeks postpartum. Yet it happens very often in the hospital disproportionately to black families. And it's under the assumption that they will go out and get pregnant too soon, sooner than we would want them to, right? Um, and so when we are doing that, there's actually an impact on lactation. So again, without the understanding of the physiology, in addition to having the context of us being sort of in a society that has racism as part of its construction, we then start to assume that these women need to have these breast birth control options because they are not likely to show up at, at their postpartum visit. And unfortunately, there is a negative impact on milk production and the ability to uh, develop a full milk supply because we are making these assumptions. So if you work in a hospital, think about that before you are sort of counseling. Look at the label, please. <laughs> Reading is fundamental, everyone. If we look at the label and the manufacturer is actually telling us not to give this prior to four to six weeks for breastfeeding moms, we need to start educating on other options because there are other options that are safe for breastfeeding moms that will not negatively impact their milk supply. However, we know the ones that do are often given to black moms. So let's think about that, um, you know, the next time we have an opportunity to. And again, so what can be done, right? There's so much, there's, it's, it's very heavy. It's, there's a lot of weight when we think about this. So what can be done? It's fairly easy, but it's also very complicated, right? Like I tell, I tell moms all the time, breastfeeding is simple in terms of the process. There's a breast, there's a baby, milk comes out, there we go, right? When the baby attaches, right? But it's actually really complicated in terms of how things work and how we can sort of support it appropriately. So normalizing breastfeeding as a way to feed baby for all family members. And this goes back to sort of the discussion around what if there's family members who are not supportive of breastfeeding, or maybe they didn't breastfeed and they feel they are feeling things that they don't know where they come from, but they, they don't, they are verbalizing that to the mom. So really normalizing breastfeeding as a way to feed baby for all family members, especially when that is mom's preference, right? Um, acknowledging any stated concerns. So again, bringing family into the conversation as opposed to sort of trying to shut them out because family is who this mom and baby are going to be around more than you as a provider. And so that's who they're going to look to and that's who they're going to be su supported by. So if we acknowledge their concerns and we sort of educate the family members, they are also going to be better able to support this family and better able to help support this baby and this mom and baby dyad to thrive when mom does choose to breastfeed. Um, providing education and offering newer, offering new information where it's appropriate. So that comes, um, that comes when, you know, you hear the, well, you don't have to breastfeed after this many weeks, right? Or your milk is no good after this many weeks. Please offer new information because new information is good, right? The more we know, the better we, the better off we are. We can make, uh, and this is true informed consent, right? So we're not withholding information. We're providing new information when there are things that are wrong. Um, and we're doing it in a way that's respectful, we're doing it in a way that is kind, and we are making sure that we are um, honoring what the mom's choice is at all times. And then also just making no assumptions about the mom or the family's lived experiences. Again, just because the data tells us that Black women are uh, breastfeed at lower rates does not mean that the Black woman in front of you doesn't want to breastfeed. So if we have that more individual approach and we're not making assumptions about this particular patient, we're better able to support them and we have a better opportunity to sort of provide that uh, additional information, education, support resources as needed so that they can sort of thrive in their feeding decision. Something else that's really important is to include family members when and wherever possible. I just want to pause and say I love this picture. All of these women are so fierce and so like amazing with their wisdom. I was so excited when I found it. So shout out to these women who are obviously very fierce and, um, you know, could probably tell us a thing or two. Um, so including family members whenever possible. Again, this is really important because family is who is going to be supporting the patient more than you. Um, whether your patient is the baby or the mom or both, it's important that we include family members in the discussion, in the dialogue, and answer some of their questions while also empowering mom 
to create boundaries that are healthy whenever possible. So I've had uh, instances where the grandmother is very much against breastfeeding and is sort of um, what one might think is as sabotaging, right? That's things I've heard from nurses. Well, she doesn't want her daughter to breastfeed. She's messing it up. We should just get her out of here. Rather than sort of sitting with the grandma and saying, wow, you look at how amazing you are for caring so much about your child and wanting to make sure that she is making the best decision. Um, and sort of having that conversation sort of really will open up uh, the dialogue so that the grandmother, the family member, the aunt, the, the cousin, the the partner, the support person can better um, influence and positively impact this um, mom and baby diet. And then family is really essential to survival. And so even with all of that historical context that I provided for, you know, the Black experience in the United States, family has been essential to survival for, you know, generations at this point. It's also important to remember that families and communities bond over food. I talked about this with Candace a while back. We were thinking about like, whenever you get together with family members, with friends, with new folks or folks you've known for a really long time, often food is involved, right? So families and communities bond over food and infant feeding is no different because there is, there's food involved and people are there. So how do we sort of engage that um, innate human nature to want to bond over food? How can we explore some of those opportunities? We can think about how we get in, uh, dad involved or partner involved when, when breastfeeding, as opposed to saying, no, that's what mom wants to do, right? We can think about how grandma can sort of be involved with um, some of the feeding opportunities, whether that is holding the baby and burping the baby after um, mom feeds or whether mom is pumping and she's able to, you know, do bottle feeds with this baby. We really want to sort of support this uh, opportunity for the family to bond because it is part of our human nature. We also want to make sure we're empowering mom to create healthy boundaries whenever needed. So again, when we are hearing misinformation, we want to sort of offer uh, opportunities for new information to come up. And it's important that we understand that elders really possess wisdom that's a major key to survival, especially for Black families and especially within the Black community, because they had to survive, right? Um, there, there's a lot of uh, understanding that when elders are talking about keeping the baby quiet, well, the baby is hungry. We have to keep the baby quiet. That actually sort of stems from this history with slavery, where if they were trying to escape or they were just trying to not be punished by the person who uh, was in ownership of them at the time, they had to keep the baby quiet. So keeping the baby quiet is generational. And it's not just, we want to keep the baby quiet, let's hurry up and feed them. It's, it's a method of survival. So it's important that we have that context so that we can understand where that information and where that advice comes from. Um, it's also important that we think about the generational trauma of enslavement as impact, potentially impacting the new mom's breastfeeding journey. And we did talk about that extensively. Um, and again, that's being able to provide sort of a, a more full picture of what the, the breastfeeding data is telling us. And finally, I like to share this slide because sometimes despite our best efforts, mom makes the decision not to breastfeed. I know it's like literally the worst thing when you do all the work and the mom's like, you know, that's, that's actually not what I want to do. Please give me the formula. For me, what's really important is was she educated on her infant feeding options? Were resources and support provided to her appropriately? Um, and something that I learned early on in my lactation career, um, I struggled with the fact that I was a black woman. I was a black mom. I had breastfed. I come from a breastfeeding mom. And when I was supporting some of my black patients, they made the decision not to breastfeed. Instead of taking that personal, I wanted to think more through why that was the case when I'm like, here I am, I'm you know, providing culturally congruent care, you look like me, we have sort of a shared experience. Um, and so I reached out to one of my lactation mentors and she told me something that still sticks with me today. And she said that sometimes a mother needs her mom who might not be in support of breastfeeding more than she needs to breastfeed. And we have to honor that. And it's really important that we recognize that it's not something that we didn't do. It's actually something that is meeting her need in that moment. And so we can then hope that we have not only just educated her on choices for the future, but ultimately planted the seed for a future pregnancy and potential future, future infant feeding decisions. And so if we do nothing else but plant that seed, 
it might not be until the third baby or the fourth baby that she wants to try breastfeeding. But it's because she was able to be supported in her infant feeding decisions prior. And she was supported in a way that honored her decisions and was not was fully respectful of where she was at that time in her life. And so with that, oops, just kidding. We're going to go there. Thoughts, questions, comments, please feel free. Let me know. And I guess I, I have a question. I'm going to ask Candace a question. Maybe this will help you all feel comfortable and feel free to, you know, chime in. Candace, I would love to know from you as a non-Black provider, how do you feel about when we think about sort of lactation equity and opportunity to really support Black families? You, you know, you're, you're not Black, right? <laughs> I think we can all see that. that you're not correct. Black. So how, that is correct. You know, I mean, we're all, we're all one humankind, but for yeah. when we think about sort of uh, the cultural competency, cultural congruency and, you know, providers that look like you, we can't always have a provider that looks like us. Yeah. So how do you, how would you approach, um, you know, having a patient that is not of your shared ethnicity, how might you support them with breastfeeding um, when you don't have that shared experience? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great question. And I think the older I've gotten, the less um, um, self-conscious I've been about being so open about these conversations. I think, especially earlier on, I was so self-conscious about just not having the right answers, period. Um, and taking a step back and then reflecting on how thinking about how me feeling self-conscious being um, incongruent with the patient that I'm trying to to speak with is actually like really taking away from the space that I need to be in and is, you know, completely antithetical to what I'm here to do as a provider. But I really like to just open it up with conversations and try to ask um, families, whoever they're with, right, whoever their support system is with it, with them there, or if it's just mom, um, ask them, you know, so what's been your experience around breastfeeding in, in your own life, right? What have you heard about it? Or it, was it something that's acceptable to you or your family or something you're interested in? I try to get a sense of where the mom is coming from and kind of what her narrative around breastfeeding is. Cause that's like so crucial to even knowing where to start the conversation. Um, and it also takes away from, um, you know, from the focus being on things that I may be presuming, right. Or, um, misunderstanding or misgaging. Maybe she breastfed her first child and maybe she's not in a space right now where that's an option for her, right? So I, I, sh I can't be presuming that it's that, that it's that anyway. But I think the other hard part too, and this is like, maybe not even just in conversation, but I know, I noticed like a lot of the posters that we have like in the clinics, right? Or the pamphlets, it's like always white babies. And so I think expanding representation on those types of breastfeeding handouts or pictures, right? Like that is also so important in terms of like as a clinic, making this a welcome place where this can, this is normative, right? It's, it's we're humanity. We're built to breastfeed. I love Whitney was saying, I have boobs. They make milk. This is how I should feed the baby. Right. Um, and so yeah. this is, I guess a few of the things that I think of, or I, I try to do when having these conversations, but I'm always learning. So I always ask to, um, you know, I always ask patients to teach me like what, what, what have your experiences been in the past too around breastfeeding? Cause that's also really important. Um, and I know Love Caroline that. has her hands up as well. So Caroline, do you want to chime in? Dr. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I had a, um, so I'm in a little bit of a different situation. I have more prolonged contact with, um, our, my black mothers. And for the first time in 2021, when we looked at, I, I work in the NICU, so I work with the preterm babies and um, babies who have um, different issues or problems. But um, for the first time, we had a health disparity in the use of um, breast milk in, mom, in black moms. We do a great job of getting moms to you know, initiate pumping and providing breast milk, and then it falls off. So it's more of a sustainability, like we get them excited, we educate them, we tell them that breast milk is best for their premature baby and decreases the risks of infection and problems. Um, sorry, I'm feeding my toddler dinner while I'm trying to listen. But um, 
No apologies. No <laughs> apologies. We love to hear the babies. But uh, <laughs> it falls off more sharply in those families. So one of the things that I'm planning on doing is like a, a breastfeeding survey to try and identify what some of the barriers are. But I don't know, Aisha, if you have... Aisha, I'm sorry. If you have... Um, any thoughts on sustainability? You know, like we're talking about initiating breastfeeding, but what about sustainability? Yep. It's a great, great question. Um, and the one that, you know, we, in, in the interest of time, I didn't share that data, but yes, there's a wonderful initiation rate for breastfeeding across, as we saw, most ethnic groups. That fall off is pretty huge. When we, when we think about um, breastfeeding to exclusive breastfeeding up to three months, it's something like 30 35%, it's less than 40% in Los Angeles County. So the sustainability piece is really, really important. I will offer a couple of things to consider um, because I think it's a multifaceted um, answer and there really isn't a, a single solution, but certain things that I have found that do impact that sustainability. One is paid family leave. The lack of paid family leave being 100% of the person's income disproportionately impacts black families. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I've had moms who have had to return to work at two weeks postpartum. I've had moms that have had to return to work at four days postpartum, because even though they apply for the disability and the paid leave, which we are lucky in California that we have something, federal paid leave is not a thing, right? So if a mom has the added stress of returning to work, and she does not know, you know, sooner than she would like. Um, and she does not know how she is going to, you know, their childcare, there's who's going to do this with the baby. If you have a NICU baby, like that's a, a totally different stressor, right? So I think some of those factors do play into the sustainability. I also would acknowledge that um, often if we don't get the, the lactation support early on um, for NICU babies in almost immediately after discharge and continuously in the first sort of few weeks after discharge, that's where a lot of fall off happens. Um, I will also offer that the way babies are fed in NICU can also be a barrier. And when I say that, I mean, if you have to graduate with a baby, if the baby has to graduate NICU by doing certain bottle feeds by certain amounts yeah. um, or has not been at the breast, yeah. or is not allowed to be at the breast for certain amounts of time, that baby going home and the mom expecting to just directly breastfeed is a recipe for disaster. It's, it's waiting, a, a disaster waiting to happen. So I do think that there are certain things that can happen in a NICU space that can be more breastfeeding supportive for post-discharge. But ultimately, there's, there's, again, several factors. And when we think about um, just the added stress of being in the NICU, being separate from your baby, and basically other people have been taking care of your baby for however long, and now you're expected to, it's very, very stressful. And when the stress is high for moms, often breastfeeding starts to sort of um, go down on the list of priorities. So it's really important to set up spaces and support structures in the NICU time, um, but then also preparing for discharge and immediately post-discharge so that we can hope to relieve some of that stress. And then if you're interested in policy, right? How do policies impact sustainability for breastfeeding? Does mom have access to a pump at home? Like some of those individualized questions can also help to inform the sustainability. Um, and then if there's out outpatient lactation access, lactation consultants are really expensive privately. So if they don't have access financially um, because their insurance doesn't cover lactation services, they won't be able to get the support that they need, especially as a NICU grad um, ongoing, and they're not going to be able to afford it potentially. So that might be another opportunity for policy to step in and say, let's cover lactation consults for everyone um, so that it relieves some of that burden for the family. I hope that answers your question. It's really complicated. <laughs> Definitely some of the things that I've been thinking at, and you've given me some more things to think about as well. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and Whitney, I saw that your hand was up and then you put it down. Did you want to say something? <laughs> yes, well, for Caroline, and I know um, when it comes to keeping up a sustainability of offering breast milk, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 
I choke on my spit all the time. Um, when I worked with, so I worked with the WIC program and I left the WIC program. So I worked with moms with NICU graduates. And one thing that I found is uh, some having um, having them make a goal for themselves. And the way that I, what I'm trying to say is like, um, what's your guilty pleasure? Is it dark chocolate? Is it Skittles? Is it something? Have a bowl of chocolate. Every time they put their hand in that bowl of chocolate, you know what? They have to commit to pumping. They have to do this, which can help them continue to keep up with pumping and offering breast milk. I mean, it's a very short-term goal, but it can help even if it's one to three times a day versus, you know what, I'm just not doing it at all because there's a love-hate relationship when it comes to pumping. And then everything you said, Asaya, like, you know, it's just so multifactorial when it comes to everything, what, you know, leaving the NICU, having that support, all of this. And so I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for this. Like I am one of two black IBCLCs in the whole state of Colorado. I was the first one and we just got another one. And so this talk right here is so needed. And I am, I'm honored and privileged to hear it and to see all of those who are on here wanting this information, digesting it. And you know what, if it makes you uncomfortable, so what? Because guess what? This is something that we all have to work through because this is, we we know what the problem is. What are the solutions? So thank you. Thank you, Whitney. That's, that's actually a good tip. Love that. Thank you so much, Whitney, for sharing. And Stephanie, I know you have your hand up as well. And Lucy, we'll get to you after Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for a great talk. Um, and Whitney, this question might be in part also kind of back to you and your point about solutions. So I am currently on call in one of the NICUs, and I feel like we were talking about um, disparities as far as um, um, donor breast milk usage. Can we, um, or it, can anybody reflect on the sides? I think that we, um, you talked about offering, um, like there being disparities in both offering and educating on the reasons of using donor breast milk. And I just wanted to know if anybody has any additional literature or things that we can do to be better there. I don't have literature. Go ahead, Whitney. I don't have literature, but I remember one day when I was sitting in the office and I had a client come in and said, I couldn't have my baby, you know, receive donor breast milk. And I was like, would you refuse a blood transfusion if you needed to stay alive? And that is the best way I can do it. Because if you need a blood transfusion, why wouldn't you want to offer donor milk? And the individual, she was a black woman, looked at me and she was like, oh, you're one of them. And I was like, yeah, I am because it's no different than a blood transfusion or getting an IV full of fluids or any type, anything that your baby needs to, to continue to thrive in the best way possible. And sometimes when you put it in that type of comparison, you know, it just clicks. It really does. Yeah. So maybe that might help you. I don't I love that. I'll also just add that um, education around human donor milk is very limited currently, um, both in the formal sense and the informal sense. So during certain periods before there was, you know, formula, informal milk sharing was a common thing, right? And not because someone was enslaved. It was because this is what, this is how babies had to live um, before there was formula. So again, when we think about society and we think about the society's impact, there's also that sort of moving away from and the push towards formula as a market that took away from the ability to educate folks and have this shared experience in community around infant feeding that was related to breastfeeding. So when we're thinking about donor human milk, one, we need more education as clinicians. That's really important. Um, it wasn't until the formula shortage that folks started to even talk about it. And it shouldn't have been the case. In lactation, we've talk, we talk about it all the time. And I want you all to know as providers, folks in your community and probably even your patients are sharing milk. It is happening whether you know about it or not. 
And so let's start to, again, have this dialogue because if we start to have the dialogue and we start to be more open about it, folks will be more willing to share. They will feel like they can trust their provider and talk about it. And providers need to educate themselves as well. We can't assume that donor milk is all bad. We can't assume that informal milk sharing is bad. But that's often the, the messaging that healthcare as a system sort of really gives to, to communities. So I think we can do a better job as healthcare providers of educating ourselves around um, the use of human donor milk. I think it's really, really important if you work in a NICU setting at all to think about how the policies around fortification impact human milk. Think around the policies around they have to drink this amount from a bottle uh, before they can get discharged. It has a big impact on the ability to breastfeed and mom's stress level around breastfeeding and infant feeding in general. Um, and then on the others, on the community side, you know, we would love to increase community awareness and knowledge around uh, milk sharing and around donor human milk. Um, if you are in a state that has a milk bank, please look up ways to partner with them. Maybe you can create a milk depot where folks can get human donor milk that um, does not require a prescription. Um, so there's, there's other options, but I think we have to start thinking outside of the current system a little bit um, to, because the current system is not supporting families. It's not supporting lactation. It's not supporting breastfeeding. And whenever the system is that way, it will always disproportionately impact black women, indigenous women, and women of color. And so if those are the folks who have the highest rates of infant mortality and all the other health disparities that exist, then we need to have targeted approaches that will first target them to close that gap and ultimately will help lead to better outcomes for everyone. Lucy, did you wanna um, ask your question or, or share your comment? Um, sure. So I am a pediatrician in Long Beach. Um, and the experience I've been having, you know, I think plays into, I believe it was a question that Carolyn said was a little bit about sustainability. You know, I work very closely with Long Beach Memorial and they're, you know, like a baby friendly hospital and they promote a lot of breastfeeding, which is amazing. And for the most part, I've, I've gotten good feedback that they see you know, lactation, um, you know, that they're see everyone is seen by lactation and they have questions and we have a hotline. And then by the time they come to me for their first visit, which is usually within the first three to five days of life, they're already, you know, I have a lot of families who've already started supplementing with formula. And I think I'm trying to figure out what my role is and how I can best like counsel a lot of these patients. You know, and sometimes I'm, I try to say, you know, why did you introduce formula? Like, why are you choosing to do both without trying to so sound, you know, as, as judgmental? And so, and then I have a lot of families who are like, I'm not making enough, you know, or a lot of moms, you know, who are like, I'm not making enough, I'm not making enough. And I'm wondering if there's like a certain pressure or kind of what, like I, I'm trying to navigate the, the gap, I guess, you know, in, in order to promote, you know, as much breastfeeding as possible and what is best for these families, but also support them that if they, you know, that, that there is anxiety about not feeding your baby, you know, and um, trying to provide reassurance, but also support in that same way. And I feel like there's something that's kind of lost in the gap. I don't know if some of the other providers have had kind of a similar experience but how to kind of and I I will ask sometimes you know what what would you like to do in the perfect world you know what what would your expectation be and how can I support you in that um but I think something is lost in between discharge and my first visit and I'm still trying to figure that out thank you for the question there is absolutely something lost <laughs> we in the lactation world know that that is when the fall-off happens it's that little time between this hospital discharge and that first newborn exam. So a couple of things that I think can be improved um, just overall. One is the patient education in patient around what to expect when they go home. Not just this is how many diapers, but also this is how your baby is probably gonna react on that second night because they don't wanna be here. It's loud, it smells, there's people doing all kinds of things to them, right? Getting dressed, not getting dressed, like they've never literally been in light before and now there's light. <laughs> they've never been in clothes before and now there are clothes. Like I think sometimes we forget that this is a, an overwhelming experience as they are transitioning from the womb to now. 
So that does play a role, right? We call it in lactation, their second night syndrome. It's not a real syndrome. It just means that babies realize on the second night that they don't want to be here and they are going to let you know about it. And that's usually now, especially with COVID, that's when, you know, those healthy babies, vaginal deliveries are going home. So when the baby is crying more, when the baby's more fussy, when the baby wants to be held all the time, the parents are going to think, oh my gosh, I, I must not have enough milk. I, the baby must be hungry. I don't know what's going on. If we're educating inpatient around, if we feed the baby more, we make more milk. Also normal baby behavior. Also, the more you put them to the breast, the more milk you're going to make. Also hand expression so they can actually see their milk. Um, that can help for that little gap time. For the time that you see them at that newborn exam, highly recommend if you can, if you have the capacity, have an IBCLC in your office. I can't tell you the countless times when I worked at Kaiser where moms were coming in assuming that they were going to be told that they had to supplement because their baby wasn't getting enough. We did a weighted feed in the clinic and their baby is drinking an ounce and a half on day three, right? If you have a skilled IBCLC who can do a weighted feed and literally show the mom, oh my gosh, look how much milk you have. Oh my goodness, look how well your baby is doing. Wow, you guys are amazing. Oh, your baby had four diapers on day three. Like that's, that's fantastic, right? So I think we can start to piece together the education, but also piecing together resources in-house. Because if you can catch those breastfeeding challenges between day three and day five, it's actually more likely that mom is going to sustain breastfeeding a little bit longer. Um, there is some research that shows if you can have them seen in an outpatient setting within the first seven days, they're more likely to breastfeed beyond two weeks, beyond six weeks, and up to two months or longer. Again, those other factors about returning to work do play a role, but we know that if you have that immediate early support, it's more likely that they are able to um, breastfeed successfully. Um, and yeah, if you do have access, you know, maybe you can get an IBCLC in your clinic one or two days a week on those days that you do see the newborn. At Kaiser, we had something called Newborn Club, which was where we saw all the newborns. We saw them in lactation first, then they saw the pediatrician. We did all of the feeding assessments. And we made sure that the mom had a really solid feeding plan going home and felt comfortable with the plan. And then you can schedule follow-ups as needed if there are concerns about weight or uh, milk production or milk, uh, milk um, increase, milk volumes of increase. I hope that helps. Yeah, and having a lactation consultant in our clinic would be a dream. We're like a big FQHC um, system in Long Beach. And so... I, I've suggested, we have some people who have been trained in lactation, but are not a certified lactation consultant. And so like, it, I think that would be like a huge next step and resource for our clinic. So I've been I'm trying to talk to our director about that as well. Please do feel free to send me an email <laughs> if you want okay. more on how we did that. that that's, why we opened, <laughs> that's why we opened the MLK lactation clinic because there was no outpatient clinics available. And I actually have patients who came from Long Beach, even though they have lots of lactation support. This was a black mom who was not supported with breastfeeding. So yeah. again, if you have questions around specifics, I'm happy to like go, you know, share more about how we did it at Kaiser because it's within the pediatrician's office, which makes it easier for the mom to not have to go to multiple, multiple places. So if you have a system that is set up in that way and you have the space, all you need is the personnel and you can really make a difference in, in those families' lives in terms of getting that early breastfeeding support. And I know we are like way over time, but I love the conversation. So shout out to y'all for having conversation. Um, really quick, there is lactation virtual office hours if you all want to join me every Tuesday from 12 to 1. If you have additional questions that were not answered today, um, if you have questions about a patient or just lactation in general, please feel free. It's going to be also in the follow-up email with information, so you can um, join that link. It's just by Zoom, and it's office hours just like in college, so feel free to jump in, ask one question, and leave if you want to. That's totally fine. No big deal. You don't have to stay the whole time. And then lastly, this one's for you, Candice. Um, for CME, just as a reminder, so you'll be getting an email about um, how to get your CME uh, credits for attending this session after this presentation. Expect it in the next few days. We're usually pretty good about getting it out in two or three days. Um, the recording will also be posted on the AAP Chapter 2 Lactation website, and I dropped the link in that um, in the chat box a little bit earlier. 
Um, and you can also watch the first two parts of this um, learning series there if you weren't able to join us for either of those. And um, the CME will be available for quite some period of time. Um, so if your friends can't watch it for a while, you got plenty of time to catch up on this series. Hopefully we'll have some more, some more sessions before the CME runs up on this series. Hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> exactly. Thank you all so much for yeah. attending tonight. So appreciate the time. I know y'all are busy. Yeah, thank you guys and happy Black Breastfeeding Week.